Adventures of the Shadow are on the air, brought to you each week by the Blue Coal Dealers of America. These dramatizations are designed to demonstrate forcibly to old and young alike that crime does not pay. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. This is Gene Paul King, pinch-hitting for his sick pal, Ken Roberts, and telling you that the Shadow starts his adventure in just a moment. But first, are you starting off the right way these cold winter mornings? Does your furnace send up quick heat the moment you open the drafts? It will if you burn blue coal. What's more, with blue coal, you'll have a truly comfortable, well-heated home all day long. So next time you order fuel, be sure to ask for blue coal. You can get blue coal and free information on low-cost home heating from your neighborhood blue coal dealer. Give him a call first thing in the morning. The Shadow, mysterious character who aids the forces of law and order, is in reality Lamont Cranston, wealthy young man about town. As the Shadow, Cranston is gifted with hypnotic power to cloud men's minds so that they cannot see him. Cranston's friend and companion, the lovely Margot Lane, is the only person who knows to whom the voice of the invisible Shadow belongs. Today's story, The Ghost Building. Jerome Neat speaking. Yes? Yes, we just completed purchase of the ground this morning. That's right. And in your story, you can say that the building we intend to erect will be the largest and finest in the world. We're calling it the Coast Building. That's right. Not at all. Goodbye. Oh, Miss Carlson, I... Why, who are you? What are you doing in here? No, no, Mr. Need, don't get excited. Who are you? You're the head of the construction company of this proposed new coast building, are you not? That's right. Now, look, if you're a reporter, I've already given the story... I'm not a reporter. I've come here to warn you not to erect that building. Now, listen, if this is a prank, it's in pretty poor taste. This is not a prank. It is simply a forecast of death and torture if the present plans go through. I don't know who you are, nor do I take any stock in your forecast. I'm sorry, but you're wrong on both counts. My forecast will, must come true. And you do know me. Oh. From where? From the past. It's slight wonder that you don't recognize me after all this time. But one day, Jerome Need, you will remember me all too well. You'll pay me back in full all that you owe me. Watch yourself. You almost missed that rivet. Oh, I, I was just thinking. You ain't supposed to think. You're supposed to catch oh, rivets. Oh, that's what I was thinking. Years from now, when my kid says to me, Pop, what did you have to do with putting up that largest bill in the world? And you'll say what? I'll say, a guy threw a rivet, and I caught the rivet. Then a guy threw a rivet, and I caught the rivet. Then a guy threw a rivet. Catch that when it's coming now. Oh, I, I didn't see. Hey, look out. Don't lean over like that. Mike, look out. Ow! Watch out above, we're swinging the girder in. Hey, boss, look yeah. at that lad up there. His back is turned, he don't see the girder. Hold it. Stop that brain, quick! Look out up there! Watch it, boss! Look out up! The... It hit him! It hit him, uh... boss! He's falling! Too many die in that squad. Too many die on this job. Hey, you got to take chances in this business, Not Joe. me, I don't. Too many dead men on the foundation of this building now. I got Anna and the kids to think about. Nah, you're talking screwy. We'll safe it up here than them guys down on the street. <laughs> Besides, Anna and them kids got to eat, don't they? Sure, don't worry. I feed them, but not from this job. I'm going below and quit now. This coast building is jinxed. Okay. Good luck, Joe. Yes. Yeah, so long, kids. So long, Joe. Hey, watch your step. Joe, hold on. <laughs> I thought you weren't coming. I'm sorry I'm late, Margot. You know, there's nothing duller than a dedication ceremony. I was beginning to think I'd have to sit through it all alone. Why, that's a fine thing to say, Margot. 
And I'm about to introduce you to Robert Lewis, the architect who designed this coast building. Oh, dear. <laughs> well, do you think you'd like to meet Miss Lane after that remark, Bob? Oh, of course I would. <laughs> I even agree with his statement. How do you do, Miss Lane? Hello, Mr. Lewis. Say, this is a distinguished gathering. Look who's among those present. Our good police commissioner. Hello there, Weston. Oh, hello, Lamont. Well. Oh, hello. hello, Commissioner. Yeah, do you know Bob Lewis? Yes, glad to see you, Mr. Lewis. Thank you, Commissioner. Oh, what brings you here, Commissioner? Duty. Just duty. These things bore me stiff. You waste half a day listening to an old stuffed shirt like Jerome Mead. Take a lot of bows and watch him lay a cornerstone. Why, <laughs> Commissioner, is that a nice way to talk about one of our leading citizens? A leading citizen, my eye. Mead is as crooked as a corkscrew. Uh, if he didn't hold a high political office, the judge would have thrown the book at him years ago. Furthermore, Ladies if we get... Ladies and gentlemen... Oh. Is your friend Mr. Need now. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure to dedicate this glorious edifice. Although there were several unavoidable delays in the building's construction, we have still finished on schedule. And today I am justly proud to present to our fair city the world's largest and most modern structure. I would like at this time to... Get up of your lies, Mr. Need. What was that? What Someone's this? cut in on the public address I system. But there's no one standing beside him. For you, Mr. Need. I shall continue your speech for you and tell the truth about this great building of yours. Where is that voice coming from? It is useless to attempt to find me. So you just have to listen. Right, Let's hear what he has to say, Margot. That's better. Many months ago, I warned Jerome Need not to try to erect a coast building. These warnings were not heeded. In reciting the glories of this building, Mr. Need did not mention one very important thing that went into its construction. Human life. Yes, human life. The foundation of this building is not all steel, brick, and concrete. There is also blood. Blood of the men who died during its construction. That's a lie. That's a lie. Be quiet. I have another warning for you, Jerome Mead. And all of you listening shall be my witnesses. The ghosts of those men who died will return to haunt the coast building. In fact, before too long, the coast building will be known as the ghost building. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I'm Mr. Cranston. Is Mr. Lewis in, please? Oh, yes. Come come right in. He's expecting you. Thank you. Oh, Bob, Mr. Cranston is here. Righto. I'm Bob's uncle, John. Oh, how do you do, sir? Uh, this is Miss Lane. How, uh, how do you do, do Miss Lane? Lane? Well, Bob. Miss Lane. Hello. Uh, won't you come on into the study? Yes, thank you. I'll have some tea prepared, Bob. Thank you, Uncle John. Uh, right in here, Lamont, Miss Lane. Thanks. Has anyone learned how that voice cut in on Mr. Need's speech yesterday, Bob? Yes. Uh, whoever it was hooked up another mic on the line inside the building. Oh, I see. But you haven't learned his identity. Uh, no. Uh, won't you sit down, please? Yes, Thank thanks. you. Frankly, I'm worried, Lamont. I'm worried because the coast building has meant everything to me. I, uh... <laughs> I don't know if I've ever told you of my earlier life, Lamont. No, you haven't, Bob. Well, I was brought up in an orphanage. Yes. Now, the only reason I tell you this is so that you might understand how important this job has been to me. You see, ever since I left the home, my one ambition was to find success as an architect. Which you certainly have. Well, I thought so until yesterday, but now I'm not so sure. Well, what do you mean, Bob? Well, if the coast building turns out as that voice predicted, if it is jinxed, then all my hopes are ruined. But surely you're not going to let an idle threat spoil this great triumph. I don't think it was an idle threat. Well, why do you say that? Well, let me show you this personal message that I discovered in this afternoon's paper. I chanced on it in the classified section. Here you are, Lamont. Read this. Where is it? Uh, right there, right at the bottom of the page. Oh, yes. To Henry Johnson, president of H.P. Johnson Corporation. This is not a warning. It is a forecast. The first of many to come. The ghosts of those who died that the coast building might be erected will return today to claim their own. Johnson has a suite of offices in that building. But surely a threat as public as that couldn't be carried out. Has anyone notified Johnson? I tried to reach him on the phone, but he was busy, so I left word for him to call me back. Well, perhaps we should go over there and... Oh, this may be he now. Hello? Oh, yes, Mr. Neal. What? When? 
I see. I'll be right over. What's the trouble, Bob? Henry Johnson has just been found in his private office in the Coast Building. Stabbed to death. Come on down, 70th floor. Well, if I can crowd in here. Step in, sir. Move to the rear of the car, please. We'll make room for you, Bill. Oh, look, Fred. <laughs> Aren't you going home a little early? Well, to tell you the truth, Fred, I read that personal in the paper today, the one that forecast death to everyone using the express elevator at exactly 5 o'clock, so I, well, I figured I'd beat the rush. Superstitious? No, just <laughs> careful. Well, it's a good thing that you're not superstitious because your watch is wrong. It's exactly 5 o'clock now. 5 o'clock. Listen, everybody. This car's out of control. Out of control. This is the last window I'm going to wash, see? Fifty-five stories is too high up. Ah, uh, stop grumbling, will you? Listen, did you see the paper this morning? There was an ad in it, see? And that ad says a window cleaner's going to do a Brody sometime today, and, brother, I just ain't going to be that guy. No, sir, I... Hey, hey my safety belt busted. Here, come here, hand. I, come here. I can't reach a car! Look, Mr. Need, I didn't ask you down to headquarters to get your opinion on what's legal and what isn't legal. That goes for you, too, Mr. Lewis. Commissioner, I'm not arguing with you at all. All right. As both Miss Lane and Mr. Cranston here know, I'm just as anxious to solve this mystery as you are. That's true, Commissioner. All right, Cranston, just let me handle this. But I can't say that I think much of your handling so far, Weston. Oh, no, Mr. Need. Well, suppose you toy with this little statement for a few minutes. I'm arresting you on suspicion of murder. What? Why, of all that... What do you base this on, Commissioner? Have you got any... Now, wait a minute, all of you. I've got a story to tell. It won't take long, but it definitely links you, Mr. Need, with these mysterious deaths. Oh, this is ridiculous. <laughs> but go ahead. Let's hear your accusation. I've been checking the newspapers to learn who was sending in those fatal ads in the personal column. And I learned that they'd been sent from various substations and paid for by postal money orders signed by different aliases. Why does that cast suspicion on me? Well, in the first place, Need, I've known you as a crook for many years. Why, you... But your fatal mistake was brought about by overconfidence. You see, the newspapers, on orders from me, did not publish the last warning they received. They turned it over to me. What are you driving at, Weston? This particular warning was addressed to Jules Seaborn, president of Seaborn and Eddie, one of the few remaining tenants in the building. It said that he'd be killed this afternoon. Have you warned Mr. Seaborn? Not personally. I left word for him to contact me. However, the warning wasn't necessary. Because I have the would-be murderer here in my office. Weston, I demand to know why you say that. Because, as I said before, overconfidence led to your fatal mistake. This last message to the papers was paid for by a money order signed by a person named Dean. D-E-E-N. Dean? Now do you understand? Obviously, Dean is need, spelled backwards. Dean, eh? I'm beginning to understand. Ah. Tell me, Weston... Was there any first initial accompanying the name of Dean? As if you didn't know. Yes, my friend, the first initial was J. J for Jerome. I thought so. John Dean. What? He was the one who warned me not to put up the coast building. He said you'll pay me back for what you owe me. Who are you talking about, me? Uh, I can't say just yet. Can't say? You're under arrest for murder and you can't say? Hello, Commissioner Weston speaking. Oh, hello, Commissioner. This is Joe Seaborn. Did you call me? Yes, Seaborn, I did. I thought you ought to know that I intercepted a newspaper ad today that forecast your being the next victim in the coast building. Oh, I see. <laughs> well, I wouldn't worry about that if I were you. No one is going to kill me in the middle of the afternoon in the world's largest office building. Besides, my secretary is right outside the door, and she... <laughs> Who's that? What do you want here? Seaborn, what in blazes is that? Put down that gun. I said, put down. Seaborn. Oh. Seaborn. I told you I was innocent, Commissioner. Well, Commissioner, who's your murderer now? More from the ghost building in just a moment. But first... 
Are you looking for a home heating plan that will really give you your money's worth? Of course you are. And that's why I recommend Blue Coal. For Blue Coal is America's finest hard coal. And no doubt about it. You see, Blue Coal comes from the very heart of Pennsylvania's richest anthracite region. Mined deep down in the earth, where only the best hard coal is found. Consequently... Blue Coal distributes a steady flow of even-burning, long-lasting, healthful heat from cellar to attic. Yes, a Blue Coal fire will keep you warm and comfortable and help safeguard your family against colds caused by chilly or underheated rooms. So fill your bin with Blue Coal. And when ordering, ask your dealer about the Blue Coal automatic heat regulator. It controls the heat in your home by automatically opening and closing furnace dampers. Yes, Blue coal and a blue coal heat regulator working together make the modern combination for real comfort and real economy. This is part of the blue coal plan for better heat at less cost. Give your neighborhood dealer a call tomorrow. His name is listed in the where to buy it section of your classified telephone directory under the words blue coal. And now we return to the ghost building. realize that there's a slight penalty for illegal entry, Margot, but it must be done. Well, I'd like to know how you came by that bunch of skeleton keys, Lamont. Why, uh, in my spare time, I whittle them. In your spare time, you whittle them. That's right, I whittle them. Uh, there we are. Uh, may I have that flashlight, please? Yes, here you are. Thank you. Yeah, you better stay close to me, Margot. All these murders that have occurred here in the ghost building, it's just possible that what I seek in Mr. Lewis's office may be pretty well guarded. I won't stray, don't worry. Well, let's have a look in this desk. May I hold the flashlight for you? Yes, please. Lamont, what if a watchman or someone should see this light? They only check this floor once an hour. I made sure of that. Well, no luck so far. What are you looking for? A very important bit of evidence that I hope to find here, but it doesn't seem to... Hello. What's this? Is that it? Is that what you were after, this letter? No, it isn't what I came after, but nonetheless, it just about cinches the case. Why? What's in it? I haven't even looked at its contents. The address in the envelope is all that I need. I'll show you what... What are you doing here? No! Steady, Margo. Answer me. Why are you here? If, uh... You take that mask off your face, I might answer you. You'll answer me now or I'll shoot. Now, look, we haven't any... Put out that flashlight, Margo. Duck! Why, you... No, no, it's no use, Margo. He's gotten away and we can't break through this panel. Lamont, where could he have gone? He's somewhere behind this wall. Did you see that trail of blood leading across the floor? I must have wounded him. Well, what can we do? I know what you can do, Margot. What? Contact Commissioner Weston at once. Tell him to send a squad of men to the ghost building because I'm certain that another murder will soon occur. Well, where are you going? I'm going to pay a call on Robert Lewis's home. As the shadow. Uncle John. Uncle John, is that you? Hmm. Thought he came in. And now let me see. There's windows on the ground floor. Space for a store. That's it. <laughs> what was that? Sorry to interrupt your work, Mr. Lewis. Who is it? Who's speaking to me? I am known as the Shadow. Where are you? I, I don't see anyone. I'm standing right beside you, Mr. Lewis. But you needn't bother to look for me. By my hypnotic power, I've made myself quite invisible to your eyes. Why are you here? What do you want of me? I would like to know where your uncle is. Why, he's out. Then perhaps you can tell me what I wish to know about him. What is it? Is he really your uncle, Mr. Lewis? Of course. Of course he is. You're lying. Now, see here, I don't... The man that you call your uncle is in reality your father. Isn't this true? No. No. And you are not Robert Lewis... You are Robert Dean, the son of John Dean, the man you call your uncle. I don't know what you're talking about. Then perhaps if I remind you of a letter, it will help. A letter addressed to you at the orphanage, postmarked 1908. 
I found it in your office. How dare you rifle my office? I checked with the orphanage and found that a Robert Dean had been left there in 1908 at the age of three, after his mother had died and his father had been sent to prison to serve a 40-year term. He was sentenced for attempted murder on the person of Jerome Need, his business associate. You, uh, you learned all this? Your father was released in October of 1940 for good behavior. And he has since made good his revenge on Jerome Need. You can't prove that. Oh, but I can. By the money order that he signed with the name J.D. Jerome Need could identify him, too. Why do you do this to me? Because you share your father's guilt. Your complicity helped him perform the murder. No, no! You built those secret passageways in the building. And I have an idea that you even have blueprints. Secret blueprints of your work. Now, where are they? You'll never get those. So you have them, then. In that drawer that you involuntarily reached Keep for. away from me. You shall never get those. Oh, prints. yes, I will. Don't put out that You're light. You're too late, Mr. Shadow. Not too late to see those prints and take get them. Get them to me. Give them back to me. You'll never get them now. No. Then you won't get me. Louis. 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 I hated letting Louis get away, but at least I have the blueprints, Margo. Here. Yeah. Take a look at them. What are those circled numbers, Mark? Well, number one was Johnson's office. Number two, the elevator shaft. Number three, the window ledge from which the cleaner fell. Number four, Seaborn's office. But what is number five? That's circle two. Uh, wait, uh, I'll look below. Wait, that's the conference room with the board of trustees. That must be the planned scene of the next murder. Oh, Lamont, do you really think so? Of course, Margot. If another vicious killing is to be averted, we must get to the ghost building at once. Come along, Margot. Weston's right down here. All right. Lamont, I wonder why the commissioner has stationed so many police on this conference room floor. Do you suppose something's happened? I don't know. I hope we're not too late. Oh, there's Weston. Commissioner! Wait a minute. Not so loud, Cranston. There's a meeting going on in there. I know. That's why I'm here. You've got to stop that meeting at once. Oh, is that so? Now, look, Weston. I happen to know that the next murder, all murders in this building, will take place in that room. Oh, you mean that ten board members all together, somebody's going to sneak in there and stab the ball. I'm <laughs> telling you the truth, Commissioner. And I'm telling you the truth. Need and his directors are holding a meeting in there. And at their request, they're not going to be disturbed. Now, that's my orders. And, Commissioner, you know how I love to break your orders. Hey, get away from that door. Oh, no. Mr. Cranston, I'm running this ship. Question. Put a handkerchief to your face at once. Oh, this room is full of a poisonous dust. Holy Moses. We must open the windows quickly. Are those men... Are they alive? There's a chance that they might be. How was it done? I was... The door... Don't talk, you fool. What? Uh, there we are. We've taken as much of this as we can stand. Come on. Yeah, I will. <laughs> I was right there. All of... You all right, Weston? Uh, yes, I will. Get some men in there. Bring those directors out. Yeah, well, that's... Senate Hill. Come on, you boy. Come on. Come on. What happened? Our room is full of a poisonous gas. Oh. It must have been released through the ventilating system. Are they... Are they dead? I don't know. I hope not. I haven't time to wait to find out. Well, where are you going? The shadow is going to follow the secret passageway in the blueprint that will lead him to the murderers. Dad. Dad, won't you let me get you to a doctor? No. No, son. It wouldn't be safe for you. Besides, I'm afraid it's too late. The wound is bleeding so much. Dad, isn't there anything I can do? Yes, Yes, Robert, there is. What is it? My plan. My plan of vengeance. You must carry it through. Knowing that, I can die happy. <laughs> what was that? The, the shadow. I see you remember me, Mr. Lewis. How did you get here? Your blueprints were a great help. And now that I am here, your plan of killing is at an end. Who is this man? I... Not see him. I am invisible to your eyes, Mr. John Dean. But I'm familiar with all you've done. The victims you've claimed in this building. He knows everything? Yes, Dad, everything. Then he must know why. Why I killed. Need sent me to prison. I was an innocent man. An innocent man. My wife died of a broken heart when they took me away. That is why I swore vengeance against Mr. Need. I've ruined him by destroying his greatest dream. Nonetheless, you and your son must both pay for your crime. No. No, not Robert. He mustn't suffer, too. He was your accomplice. Your willing accomplice. I see. 
Then you forced me to change my plans. Yes. What do you mean? I have a charge of dynamite planted down here for just such an emergency as this. I'm about to die anyway, and if my son is to face the electric chair, I'd rather he went out with me, taking all others with us. I wouldn't advise you doing that, Mr. Dean. You're too late, Mr. Shadow. My son has slipped over to the plunger that will set off the charge. See? Even now, he awaits my words. Yes. Yes, how do you like that, Mr. Shadow? Don't touch that dynamite, Lewis. Go on, son. Now. The plunger now. Yes. Yes. (laughs) Nothing happened. No. I should have told you that I discovered your dynamite and took the precaution of cutting the wires. I guess there's nothing left to do now, gentlemen, except to wait for the arrival of the police. And so, before pronouncing sentence on you, John Dean, and your son, Robert Dean, I would like to point out to you and to all other members of society that no matter how great a grievance you have against an individual or individuals, you have neither a legal nor a moral right to seek a personal vengeance to atone that grievance. Your case is an object lesson of a familiar phrase that cannot be repeated too often. Crime does not pay. And now, before we hear from The Shadow again, a brief word from John Barclay, America's home heating expert. Mr. Barclay. Thank you, Gene Paul King, and good evening, friends. You know, of all the letters I've received recently, one from a man upstate interested me particularly. He wanted to know why his furnace fire kept dying out. Well, in the first place, a well-kept fire doesn't die out unless something's wrong with the draft. And a poor draft may be due to any number of causes, such as loose bricks in the chimney or blocked flue passages. So I advised him to get in touch with his neighborhood blue coal dealer immediately. Since then, he writes me that a John Barclay trained serviceman discovered the trouble was a leaking connection around the smoke pipe where it entered the chimney. Naturally, this caused him a great deal of unnecessary inconvenience until it was fixed. Well, I just thought I'd mention this as an example of a common complaint. And in case you're not entirely satisfied with the results your furnace is giving you, let a John Barkley trained serviceman give it the once-over. He can probably help you, too. For this extra customer service, just phone your neighborhood blue coal dealer tomorrow morning. Thank you. Today's program is based on a story copyrighted by The Shadow Magazine. The characters, names, places, and plot are fictitious. Any similarity to persons living or dead is purely coincidental. station, the Blue Coal Dealers of America bring you an adventure of the shadow that will send thrills racing up and down your spine. So be sure to listen, and be sure to phone your friendly Blue Coal Dealer for greater heating comfort at less cost. This is Jane Paul King saying, keep the home fires burning with Blue Coal.